In the war between good and evil, there is nothing the enemy will not attempt if he thinks it will frustrate and belittle the plan of God on the earth. His number one target are the children of the saints of the living God. And one of his ploys has been the significant use of dinosaurs. You see, dinosaurs in the Bible are now super important to the body of Christ, primarily because the liberal social engineers of America successfully use them to begin the dumbing down of our own sons and daughters against the authority of God's word and the cross work of Jesus Christ. The contents of this DVD were filmed on location in Indianapolis, Indiana to a congregation of believers. And it is my earnest prayer that your questions can be answered and your faith substantiated in the absolute authority of God's word by something presented in this lesson. When we talk about dinosaurs, we've got to recognize that we're not dealing with any issues that are new. We don't have a better scientific approach than the secular scientific community. But we have a feasible, very satisfying approach, and we see how both of us look at the same bones and fossils and make different interpretations from the twin models that I presented to you this morning. There is an evolutionary approach, there is the creationist approach, we look at the same data, we come up with completely different applications. The dinosaur issue is of the same context. We don't really have a scientific way to explain dinosaurs. We don't find too many of them running around today, okay? Um, we find their bones in every continent of the world. We find them throughout the United States, particularly in the Hell Creek Formation that runs up through Wyoming, South Dakota, Montana, and so forth. Huge amounts of dinosaurs. We find them in Kansas. Some of these dinosaurs on this stage came from Kansas. That's an interesting kind of reality. But when we talk about dinosaurs, then to say that one view is more scientific than another view is not really true because the way we interpret dinosaurs is directly and totally dependent upon how we interpret the rock record. How you look at what we call the geologic column, which is not a real observable entity anywhere in the world because there's no place really to go to see the entirety of the geologic column as it's presented in textbooks. I debated a guy one time in the Oklahoma City Community College and I told him, I said, do you realize that the geologic column from the Cambrian to the recent rock layers is nowhere to be found as it is presented in the textbooks, the nice little tidy, you know, stack of rocks. Do you realize that if all the six divisions of the Ordovician were available, it would probably require about 30 miles of rocks stacked on top of each other. We just don't find the rock record as it's presented in textbooks. As a matter of fact, at the Grand Canyon, only five of the 10 systems are available and they're all out of order. I'm glad I don't have to explain that. I mean, we've got 500 million year rocks, rocks sitting on top of 200 million year old rock and nothing in between. Well, where did it go? And how do you superimpose 500 million years of rock on top of 200 million years of rock without anything in between it? That's an incredible dilemma, an enigma, you know, wrapped up in a riddle, tied up in a mistake, I think. But the point is simply this, it's an in incredible reality that we will look at dinosaurs in the same light that we interpret the rock record. If you think the rock record is hundreds of millions of years old, beginning with the Cambrian layer, and that it presents not only a systematic unfolding of gradual developmental life from simple to complex, and you think that these fossils that are in this rock record are representative of ages of life that disappeared and then life reappeared and disappeared and then reappeared in these spurts and surges from the beginning of the rock record to the recent, then you will think dinosaurs that we find most often in rock layers that have been identified as being Mesozoic, okay? The Triassic, Jurassic, and the Cretaceous rocks. You will think that those animals that lived in those rocks must be 
from 200 million years to 65 million years old. Because that's how you think about it because of the model of geology that you've chosen to embrace. But that particular model has willfully ignored the flood. And if you willfully ignore the evidence for the worldwide flood event, then you're left on your own to bring naturalistic expression to the rock record, and this is what you come up with. And you interpret dinosaurs then from your interpretation of the rocks. If you believe there was a worldwide flood of it, as described in Genesis 6, 7, and 8, then you realize that that's the bottom line to the whole controversy. If there was a 371-day flood event in which Noah built an ark and God brought two of every kind of land creature that was created on day six into that ark, and of course, when did God make dinosaurs? When did God make reptiles? He made land-dwelling animals on day six. There isn't any other biblical explanation for the creation of life other than day six life being land-dwelling terrestrial life forms. So God made dinosaurs or land-dwelling reptiles on day six. These are just lizards. I call them God's gospel lizards. <laughs> and God made those on day six. If that's the truth, then God brought two of every kind of animal he made on day six, including seven of the winged fowl, seven of the clean animals, and he took them into the ark to Noah. Okay? So that included these great creatures we call dinosaurs. Obviously, God would not have put on the grandmas and grandpas. He put on young folks. Matter of fact, the reason God saved animals in the ark was to reproduce them once the tragedy or the catastrophe was over. And so when he put them on the ark, his idea was that they would reproduce within their kind from the time they got off of the ark until they died. He would not have put them on as grandmas and grandpas for a very significant, very obvious reason. Grandmas and grandpas don't have much offspring. He put them on young and yearling, and we realized that when the T-Rex was young and yearling, they're not a whole lot larger than a calf. When the giant long neck that can get 70 tons and 80, 90 feet long, we found their eggs all over the world, and their eggs get about the size of soccer balls, sometimes uh, football. And so when that animal was born, it was maybe five, six, eight, ten feet long and weighed 15, 20 pounds. And so they grow uh, rather rapidly, and uh, probably at the time they were ushered into the ark, they were about the size of modern elephants. And so when we see these kinds of issues, it helps us understand why God put them on the ark. We therefore interpret the evidence we see in the rock record from a plain, literal biblical flood model. And so we call this the truth about dinosaurs, truth in the sense that this is truth for a Bible believer. And it's feasible and makes sense when you consider all of its factors. We understand there was an article in National Geographic in March of 2004 by Professor Jack Horner, the head of paleontology at Montana State University, and he said, there's a huge amount of arm waving. He said, for 20 years we've done what we call arm waving. A legendary bone collector says, we've made hypotheses based on very little evidence. Now we're sitting down and we're saying, we've got all of these ideas. Are they real? Isn't that interesting? How many has been to a museum that said that dinosaurs became birds? Have you been to one? Do you realize that that seems to be the basic stock opinion or idea for the dinosaurs, but that's just one school of thought? In this particular article of March 2004 in National Geographic, the author of this article, which took up almost half of the entire yellow journal, interviewed 15 to 16 of the world's most significant dinosaur experts and got 15 or 16 opinions. 
They just don't agree. So we find there are some scientists who believe dinosaurs became birds and some scientists like Dr. Larry Martin from the University of Kansas or Alan Fiducia from North Carolina or Storrs Olson from the Smithsonian, the head of ornithology, says it's absolutely impossible for dinosaurs to become birds. So there's two schools of thought. If you hear one guy on Discovery Channel, he might say this very forcefully, but be aware of the fact he does not have the consensus of the scientific community. It's just a community of thought or a school of thought, and they're in great debate. As a matter of fact, at the end of this article, they had to face the reality that we know less about this particular issue than we really know. But it was still exciting because what we don't know about dinosaurs is far more than what we know. Well, does that sound what, like what they say on National Geographic program? This is still a new and evolving science. We've just scratched the surface. That was the opinion of this interview of 16 of the world's most significant dinosaur experts. And so please be aware, we don't really know much about these animals. We know they existed. But you have to have some kind of a belief system to dictate to you how you interpret the evidence. And if you willfully ignore the flood that we'll talk about in greater degree tomorrow night, please don't miss tomorrow evening. We will discuss what that does to us when you deliberately ignore the flood. Well, the, the fossil record is incredibly poor. And because of the poverty of the fossil record, we understand that dinosaur fossil record is actually rather poor. Intact, articulated, museum-quality museum skeletons are fairly rare. Fossils fall apart. Fossils are rocks. Let's say that together. Fossils are rocks. Have you ever read in a textbook about the scientists finding what they call living fossils? And when you think that fossils are rocks, could you explain to me what a living fossil is? Now, my wife thinks that that's what I'm becoming, <laughs> okay? But fossils are rocks, and the uh, National Geographic says a bone exposed to elements may simply explode. In some bone beds, there are so many tiny skeletal fragments, you'd think the creatures had been dropped from a plane. In other words, they don't find well-articulated skeletons very often. Now, this triceratops to my left, was one such animal, the skull of this animal was nearly 100% complete, and the postcranial skeleton was nearly 80% complete, so that is a very unique skeleton. It was found in South Dakota, laying underneath a huge flow that appeared probably to be an underwater turbidite flow or a mud flow. In other words, it agrees with the kinds of things you would expect to find if there had been a worldwide flood. Okay, but this guy over here to my right called an Albertosaurus, that guy was found in Choteau, Montana. It was only 55% complete, and so they have made a composite of it from other Albertosaurs to make a total skeleton, but they only found 55% of the entire skeleton. You must realize that they don't find these things already put together. They find fragments. In some cases, they find just portions of them. Let me tell you a story. Henry Fairfield Osborne was the guy who named the T-Rex T-Rex. Henry Fairfield Osborne was the director of the American Museum of Natural History between 1905 about and 1927. He found a few teeth and jaws and other piece of fossil fragments and he said, what big teeth you have, my dear, and what big jaws you have, better to smash you with and he said, this is a terrible, nasty, ugly, mean thing. We're going to have to call it Tyrannosaurus Rex, which means tyrant lizard king. King of the tyrant lizards. How many know that it was another 83 years before they dug up a T-Rex that was complete enough to include its front arms? So now they got a problem. They've got the meanest animal that ever lived. <laughs> that has a serious problem. If you're going to go out on Saturday night and whip everybody in town, and you're limited to your arm reach, you can't even cover your nose, you've got a serious problem. Matter of fact, they tell us that if 
a T-Rex in its mature state fell, it couldn't catch itself with its little puny arms, its head would hit the ground at six times gravity, and that's several times more than an ibuprofen headache. That's lights out, brother. <laughs> Just falling down. Well, the Jurassic Park scenario really revived the dinosaur interest. How many have seen Jurassic Park? That's our problem. <laughs> USA Radio Network called me one day and said, Dr. Sharp, we'd like for you to do an expose on Jurassic Park. I said, well, I don't ever go to the movies. I, it's not that I don't, I just don't have time to go to the movies. He said, well, uh, we need you to d talk a, about Jurassic Park. We, we've got people calling our radio station in our religious department and telling us they think that there might be some about this that may be scientifically documentable. I said, wow, okay. So I had never been to a Spielberg deal. I mean, Steven Spielberg is a dude. I'm telling you, he does special effects like you can't believe. And so I'm, I'm going in, you know, and you got to get in the mood of the cinema. So you go in and you buy uh, a bag of popcorn and you get in a spell when you go in the cinema. You're willing to pay six or seven dollars for four or five grains of corn. And you're willing to pay three dollars and fifty cents for six ounces of drink. It's a most amazing kind of thing. I wish we could do that at church. <laughs> so I'm sitting there and all of a sudden the raptors and the T-Rexes and everything and its brother is running up and down the aisle. They're breathing down my neck. They're jumping out from behind the curtains. I'm dodging and flinching. I can't get my breath. I can't even stay on the movie. I've got to go back the second time to stay up with the transitions so I can understand what they're saying. Then I read Michael Crichton's book and, and Crichton says, well, we got a problem in the book. The old man walks into the laboratory. Remember the old man hobbling on the cane? He walks into it. We got a problem. What's the problem? Well, we found this mosquito preserved in amber, that's fossilized tree sap, and we're convinced that the blood in the mosquito is from a T-Rex. Well, I've never been in to discover how a modern mosquito with a proboscis about the length of maybe um, three millimeters could drill through the skin of a T-Rex. But nonetheless, they found this blood, assuming that it was T-Rex blood, they said, we've got a serious problem. And so I went to do some research to understand what it was that they were identifying as the problem. And I found out the minimum estimate for the genome of a T-Rex is 4 million DNA molecules, nucleotides in a sequence. Now that's the minimum. It could be as much as 40 million, but, but we'll use the, the minimum, 4 million the DNA sequences. And what did they find in the mosquito? 250. Yeah. He said, we've got a serious gap. Folks, that's not a gap. That's a barn door. I mean, if you're missing 3,999,750 nucleotides, it's, you don't have a gap. You've got a huge space. So where did they go get the DNA to fill in the gap? What? A frog. Yes, that's what they proposed. And if you get 99% of the DNA from a bullfrog, you're not going to get a T-Rex out of that outfit. It might be a bullfrog with big teeth, but nothing <laughs> other than that. So now you got the arm problem, got the DNA problem, and then, you know, in the movie, the first movie, Jurassic Park, the T-Rex breaks out of the fence and he slurps down, you know, the little goat sitting there and he runs over after he knocks the jeep over and scares the kids, he runs over and knocks the outhouse down, and eats the guy in the outhouse, slurp, and then he takes off after the, the jeep. And you know what Spielberg did? Here comes this six-ton T-Rex running after this jeep, and he homes in with his camera right on the speedometer, and it's bumping on 45 miles an hour. So now you've got this two-legged lizard running three feet off the ground, 45 miles an hour. Well, a professor from Stanford University did a locomotion study on the T-Rex and said, well, folks, let me tell you something. This animal, with the mass within the skeletal portion of its leg or running apparatus, could hardly run, maybe walk, probably waddle. It would have to have twice the mass in its skeletal leg portion of its entire body in order for it to run. So now we've got some pretty significant, compelling evidence that the T-Rex didn't run 45 miles an hour, maybe 12, maybe 15 at the top.
Okay, so now we've got a real problem. So now there is a big school of division within the secular community. Some are saying, well, the T-Rex was not a predator. It was a scavenger. And some are saying, no, 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 no. It was still a wild predator. And so they're fussing at one another. And that's fun. I'm glad they're fussing at one another. Because that helps me understand they don't know as much about it as they're trying to tell us they know. They're really at war about whether the T-Rex was a scavenger or a predator. And so we recognize this is some of the problem in interpreting the fossil record. Well, what really bothers me is that Bill Nye the Science Guy bounces all over the television and tells our kids, you know, and Barney the Purple Dummy, <laughs> and others of these experts, and tells us that the dinosaurs lived 200 something million years ago and died out 65 million years ago. Well, what does that mean to you and I as a Bible believer? It means a very devastating reality to the gospel of Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul said in Romans 5, 12, Therefore, through one man, death entered the world. Okay, or sin entered the world. And death through sin. He said in 1 Corinthians 15, 21, By man came death. Say that with me. By man came death. Not by dinosaurs. By man came death. The view of death determines your worldview about salvation. If you think dinosaurs were on the earth killing and eating, air-breathing, blood-containing life forms 65 million years before the first man got here, you've just violated the integrity of the Apostle Paul. There was no death on the earth until after Adam sinned. That's the devastating reality of the dinosaur story. And that's the baggage that is hidden within the stuff when your children get so enthused about it. Did you realize that the liberal media, worldview con controlling, left-handed segment of our society has deliberately spent billions and billions of dollars in the control of the thinking of your children and they subtly slip in on their blind side and tell them about dinosaurs and spin this yarn about 65 million years knowing all the time you can't find the geologic column in any portion of, of the world anywhere and yet they still spin this yarn knowing that the age factor of the rock layers was arbitrarily assigned by lawyers and agriculturalists and other kinds of non-geological professionals, and yet they hang in there and tell your children those realities, and all the while, it's dumbing them down against the authority of the Scripture. That's the tragedy of the excitement of dinosaurs among young men and women between the ages of 3 and 10 years of age. And I'm telling you, you know, there's hardly any young man anywhere in the United States that doesn't, you know get palpitations when he starts thinking about seeing dinosaurs. We recognize then that there's a real problem in the dinosaur story with regard to the extinction factor. I'm writing a book now on dinosaurs and I hope to have it done this summer. So I went to the University of Oklahoma library, very complete library, probably five or six million volumes. I went down in the stacks and started digging through, and I went into the microfiche and the microfilm, started pulling out articles, and I found several extinction theories. Now, we've all been told that dinosaurs became extinct because of an asteroid or a comet impact strike. But do you realize that the journals of science show at least 20 prominent theories, including little green men? One group of scientists said, we're convinced that the dinosaurs became extinct because of methane gas poisoning. And I'm not going to tell you where they said the methane gas came from. It's rather funny. <laughs> it's an interesting reality that all of these theories of extinction exist. And one of the great dinosaur experts, Doc, Dr. Edwin Colbert, who was the curator of the two big dinosaur halls at the American Museum, he got his PhD in Columbia, he wrote in a, his uh, recent book, that probably we will never understand the extinction of dinosaurs because he said we really can't explain 
how a global catastrophe would kill large reptiles and leave the small reptiles alive to this very day. We find in the rock record alligators and turtles and snakes and dinosaurs. Okay? But today, we have alligators and turtles and snakes still alive. He says, what kind of a selective catastrophic event would have wiped out the large lizards, lizards and left the small ones to survive to this hour? And so we realize that the extinction problem is a real difficult problem. And so they have drawn a line on their geologic charts called the KT boundary between the Cretaceous layer and the modern rock. And KT is a, the German uh, initials for the word Cretaceous. And they say there must have been an asteroid strike because they find a lot of iridium, which is uh, an element that's rather rare and it's found uh, in space in many instances. And so they said this is probably the result of an asteroid strike. And now they've discovered that iridium is very prolific in volcanic explosions. <laughs> The Bible says all the fountains of great deep were broken. In other words, when the flood started, there was global volcanism, which is an indication that we've got a serious explanation for the uh, appearance of all this iridium uh, in the mid part of the geologic layers. It's a part of what we would expect to find if there was volcanism and the volcanism continuing in residual effects probably for a thousand years. We'll talk about that in greater degree tomorrow night. The reality is, let's look at this uh, quote coming up here about this line they draw. In the New Scientist, September 1st, 1983, why do geologists draw a line across their time charts at 65 million years ago and talk about the boundary between the age of dinosaurs or in more recent rocks? Pressed on this point by an audience at the recent British Association meeting, Professor E. R. Oxberg, president of the Association's geologic section, said that all such boundaries are arbitrary and can be drawn anywhere you like. Hello? In other words, the boundary on the geologic column between the Cretaceous rocks, the age of dinosaurs, and the tertiary rocks, those more recent, is purely arbitrary. It exists as a line on paper, not something real that you can really find in the rock record. As a matter of fact, the extinction of dinosaurs, according to the book Dinosauria, a, a tome of literature about dinosaurs, tells us that it's based on two counties in Montana. I think that's interesting. So we recognize we've got some real problems with regard to this entire business. When we think of how fossils are made, then it demands a worldwide flood event. When we think about how fossils are found, it also demands a worldwide flood event. Dr. Brintsmeyer, who is famous for her establishment of the famous rat called Morgie at the Smithsonian, she said, because mass mortality, now listen to this quote, it's a little brainy, but it's okay, you'll get it. Because mass mortality and instantaneous death and burial create the optimal initial conditions for fossilization. What did she say? Mass mortality and instantaneous death and burial create the optimal conditions for fossilization. What's she talking about? The flood. She doesn't know that. It is possible that a significant portion of our fossil record is due to such exceptional events. Oh, is that so? Dr. Colbert said, when we moved all the earth out at the Ghost Ranch Formation, New Mexico, we uncovered this veritable fossil graveyard of dinosaurs. The Coelophysis fossils were in there like a jack straw puzzle of logs that had been floated into a jam. He said there had to have been a huge flood here. Well, duh. They told me, I was up in Kansas, they said, do you know that all of Kansas was covered in water? I said, you don't mean it. <laughs> yeah. So I was down in Oklahoma looking around and digging around some fossils. A guy walks up and said, did you realize that all of Oklahoma was covered with water? I said, you think it was the same water that was in Kansas? <laughs> Happened in Texas? 
Matter of fact, all over the world. In other words, the secular science admits that the world has been covered with water. That's interesting to me. She goes on to say, once an organism dies, there is usually intense competition among other organisms for the nutrients stored in its body. Scavenging. She says, this combined with physical weathering <clears throat> and dissolution of hard parts, decomposition, soon leads to destruction, unless the remains are quickly buried. Let's say that together. Quickly buried. Two enemies of fossilization. Scavenging, decomposing, decomposition. Two enemies. If you don't do away with scavenging, if you don't do with decay, you're not going to have fossils. So she says it requires quickly, rapidly burying these remains. Burial is the most critical step in the process of preservation. And the only permanent burial, and only permanent burial will produce lasting fossils. Quick, rapid, sudden, abrupt, significant burial. What does that sound like to you? The flood of Noah. That's exactly right. So I think that's interesting. Well, what I want to do in the remainder of my time is deal with five questions I've been asked all over the world about dinosaurs. The first question is, did they really exist? One guy down in Texas walked up to me one day and he said, Dr. Sharp, um, I really don't believe these are real. Matter of fact, he said, I don't think we really landed on the moon. I think that was performed in Hollywood just to fool us. And he said, I'm beginning to think maybe the world is flat. <laughs> well, when you meet somebody like that, best just close up you know, your suitcase or briefcase and go home because those kinds of people are like cement, all mixed up and firmly set. Uh, you're going to do a whole lot with them. Um, did dinosaurs really exist? One lady said to me, don't you think the dinosaurs were created by the devil? I said, no, ma'am. The devil didn't create anything. No, they really happened. God did it. Not a big deal. We're going to talk about that. The second question is, if they did really exist, when did they exist? What about this 65 million year thing? We want to talk about that. The next question is, what happened to them? Where'd they go? The next question is, could any of them have been on the Ark of Noah? Is that possible? The next question is, could any of them still be alive today? I've been asked those five questions. I'm going to give you the answers that I believe are as suitable and compelling as I can discover about these particular answers. But I want to set up the way I want to think about this theoretically. I want to go to John 3.12. Jesus said, if I tell you earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? So one of the things the enemy does to us to dissuade us about our destiny is to confuse us about our origin. Do you get that? The first thing that goes, the first thing that's jettisoned when you start dallying around with naturalism and naturalistic exp uh, expressions of origins issues is the promise of his coming. And we'll see that in 2 Peter tomorrow night. So, I want to answer the question, identify a verse, and see if the verse in the scripture predicts the kinds of things that we should see when we go see, and then when we go see, do we really see what we expect to see on the basis of the prediction of the, of the flood model, the creation model in that particular question. So that's how I want to deal with this. First question then is, did dinosaurs really exist? Well, someone should say, now, <laughs> how are you going to find a scripture about dinosaurs existing do you not know the word dinosaur is not even in the Bible? Yeah, I know that. Well, why is it not in the Bible? Well, I'm glad you asked. There's a definite reason why it's not in the Bible. Because a scientist by the name of Owen, about 19, excuse me, 1841, he was an anatomist. 
He lived contemporaneously with Charlie Darwin. He was the first director of the British Museum of Natural History. They had brought him a megalosaurus and an iguanodon and other such dinosaur fossils. And he was looking at them and scratching his head. He said, I've never seen such reptiles as these. These guys were giant lizards. And he was writing up his results in a paper he was going to deliver to the British Association with Advancement of Science. And as the result, he looked at these animals and said, my goodness, these were terrible lizards. And he said, wow, that's going to be a good name till I can figure it out. But he says, I can't write this in English. I've got to write it in Latin. Is it not intriguing to you, ladies and gentlemen, that science is done in Latin and we quit teaching Latin in America about 40 years ago so that scientific terms becomes abstract and confusing to your children? There's something wrong with that. And science measurements are calculated with metric values and we don't in many school districts teach metrics anymore. I think that's a problem with our philosophy of education. But nonetheless, he found out that terrible lizard is dinosauria. And he wrote it in his paper and it became published in 1842. And the first appearance of the word dinosaur is when his paper was published forever. It had never been appeared any time at any point in any period in history ever before or he printed that and now we read the word dinosaur well the word dinosaur then goes back to its origin in 1841-42 the English Bible was translated the first time in 1380 that's the Wycliffe Bible and then the Geneva Bible in the latter part of the 1500s and then the King James Version came out about 1610 or 11 and so we realize that the Bible was translated into English in its principal translations years before the word dinosaur was even invented. Matter of fact, hundreds of years. And so the reason the word dinosaur doesn't appear in the Bible is because the word dinosaur hadn't been invented yet. But the phrase terrible lizard has a Hebrew meaning and it appears in the Bible 25 times. In Genesis 1, 21, it appears the first time and it's the word tanim, and God's created the great tanim. Genesis 1, 21, appears 25 times in the Old Testament. 20 of the 25 times in King James, it's translated dragon. What's a dragon? A terrible lizard. You're exactly right. In other words, one of the nuances of meaning for the Hebrew word tanim is terrible lizard. So it does appear in the Bible, and it appears in Genesis 1, 21 and 24 more times. Well, when we go out, what do we find? We find their fossil bones everywhere. We find them in every continent of the world. Okay, second question. So when did they exist? What about the 65 million years? Well, Exodus chapter 20, verse 11 is where I want to go here. And the Bible says, For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth and the sea and all that is in them and rested on the seventh day. What about the days of creation? Were the days 24 hours long or were they millions or billions of years long? Have you ever read the covenant of day and night in jo or excuse me, Jeremiah chapter 33, verse 19? Let's look at that covenant. Jeremiah 33, 19, And the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah, saying, Thus says the Lord, If you can break my covenant with the day and my covenant with the night, so that there will not be day and night in their season, you may also break my covenant with David my servant, so that he should not have a son to reign on his throne. Is this important to God? Yeah. If you can break the covenant God made with day and night. When did God make a covenant with day and night? He made the covenant with day and night on the first day of the creation week when he divided the light from the darkness and he called the light day and the darkness he called night. And then and only then did he say, and the evening and the morning were the first day. That's why he said, in John 11, verse 9, when he was going to raise Lazarus from the dead to the disciples that went with him, he said, are there not 12 hours in the day? Why did he say that? He's the one who made the covenant. God made a covenant to control the length of day and night in a 24-hour cycle and did it on day one of the creation week. And the covenant is listed and spoken of in the book of Jeremiah. So we understand it's impossible for the days of Genesis to be anything more than 24-hour periods. 
Now, when you think about who God is, you wonder why it took so long. <laughs> he did that on purpose because the six-day work week, one-day rest period, he did for our benefit. And the fourth commandment justifies that reality in Exodus chapter 20, verse 11. It says, For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything that is in them and rested on the seventh day. So on day six, day six is when he made land-dwelling creatures. That's when he made these animals. So, 65 million years, it's a flight of evolutionary fantasy. They must have lots of time, so they work at creating lots of time. Okay? Every one of their answers, I don't have time to deal with this evening, it would require another hour, but every one of their answers are challenges to the biblical view can be academically, intellectually, grammatically answered satisfactorily, and it makes sense to me. And so we understand that God created these creatures along with other land-dwelling creatures on day six, and they lived with men. Now, do we have evidence of them living with men? We have lots of evidence of them living with men. I'm going to give you one evidence. A colleague of mine, Dr. Don Patton, was in Cambodia in 2005, I think it was. It may have been 2006. It was 05 or 06. And he had heard about some of these old Hindu temples back in the interior of Cambodia that had some unique and strange reliefs carved into the columns of the doors of these buildings. We find these all over the world, these kinds of things. So he went there, and here, that's him standing off in the shadow of the doorway. That's Dr. Patton. And those columns are on either side of him. Okay? So we're going to get a close-up. There is a close-up of the column. Notice the animal that's carved in as a relief into that column that's right there in front of you. What does that look like to you? Does anybody want to offer me a suggestion? What do you think, son? Yes. Stegosaurus. Isn't that interesting? And that temple has been historically verified to be 8 to 9 A.D. In other words, those carvings were etched into that stone 12 to 1300 years ago, and notice they're not skeletons. They're living replicas of the animal, meaning they were running around. They saw them. They find these things in South America. They find tapestries. They find bronze and brass reliefs etched in old churches in Western Europe. We find evidence of all the time. And you don't hear about it because it's very demeaning to a 65 million year old kind of idea. <laughs> Every major civilization of the world has a legend of dinosaurs and the flood. Over 275 have been documented. They had them. They fought them. You should read uh, Bill Cooper's book, After the Flood. It's remarkable. He did a 27-year study before he wrote the book. It's a remarkable book about these kinds of interesting finds that he's discovered. He found over 200 references to these kinds of large reptiles fighting men in Great Britain. I think it's interesting. And so it agrees with what we would predict from the biblical flood model. And I just simply think you need to know it. There's a lot of other evidences scientifically, uh, anthropologically. There's a lot of these evidences available. But these are some that help you understand that we're convinced that the biblical view is an accurate view, or at least a compelling view, and it requires your attention. Okay, the second or third question is asked. So we're, uh, where'd they go? Well, this could take 30 minutes. I'm going to do it in three. Where'd they go? Well, every animal that didn't uh, get put in the ark died in the flood. There's no doubt about that. That's why we find their fossils. We find many of them. Many of them we have never found. There are many, many more fossils than, than we've ever found. And there's probably animals that died and were completely made extinct by the flood itself and uh, completely decayed because uh, before they became fossilized. The reality is... We find these incredible animals in the fossil record and we understand 
that they all died in great mass extinctions, which the biblical flood model would justify that prediction. But the Bible says two of every kind of animal that lived on day six was put in the ark. And so we go to the word of the Lord to determine if this is true. And we look at the book of Job, chapter 40, verse 15, and I'm particularly looking at the New International Version. And I'm using the International Version because I don't like the notes in the International Version. How many realize that C.I. Schofield or Finnis Dake were not the fourth and fifth persons in the Godhead? You understand that? Okay. The text is inspired, not the notes. Well, in the New International Version, there's a little uh, hyperdiacritical mark by the word behemoth, and it refers down to um, the notes, the, or the marginal rendering, and it says probably a hippopotamus or maybe an elephant. So let's look at the text. Look at behemoth which I made along with you, which feeds on grass like an ox. So what does that tell us? Well, whatever behemoth was, it lived with man, and it was an herbivore. Next verse. It says, what strength he has in his loins, and what power or muscles, uh, uh, power in the muscles of his belly. So what we have here physiologically and anatomically is an animal that has a very special pelvic girdle, and I think it's interesting that there's two kinds of dinosaurs, bird hips and lizard hips. And we believe that the big bird-hipped lizards, the big long necks, had the ability to lift their upper body up, balancing on their hind tail, and forage high up into trees. This animal has a unique kind of hips, okay, very special loins, and has very strong stomach muscles. Now. Can hippos do that? They have trouble walking in water, okay? <laughs> elephants can be trained to do that. So I think we've effectively eliminated the, the hippos. The elephants are still in the running. Next verse, verse 17, says, His tail sways like a cedar. What's a cedar? Yeah, I shall never forget giving this presentation to a group of fourth graders. You want to have fun? Go teach a bunch of fourth graders. I was in a school down in Central Texas, had 90 fourth graders. They all came in, and this one little boy sitting on the front row, and he was ordered to sit up there because he had a bad case of the heebie-jeebies. You ever seen a fourth grader with the heebie-jeebies? I mean, he can't sit still. He's, he's in trouble. And I see, he needed some relief. And so I said, hey, yeah, do you know what a cedar is? He said, yes, I know what a cedar is. I said, well, come up here and tell us. He jumped out of his seat and he got the microphone and he turned around just as proud. He said, a cedar is what farmers use to plant seeds with. <laughs> the things kids say. Took me a while to get over that, okay? Little boy in honor said, oh no, it's a tree. Yes, this word in Hebrew means to be tenacious at its roots. It's call, it's referring to the cedars of Lebanon. Okay? We have three cedars of Lebanon growing in our little city in Oklahoma. This one is just three or four blocks down from our office. It's in the backyard of a friend of mine. It's about five feet across the stump. That young lady standing there is five feet tall. The cedar of Lebanon is a gigantic tree. So now then, we've got an animal that sways its tail like a cedar. Okay? Let's look at this picture coming up. At the University of Oklahoma, well, do you think that looks like a cedar? <laughs> don't, <laughs> I don't think so. The University of Oklahoma, they've got an apatosaurus they found in the panhandle. It's got a tail 30 feet long, and the ventral and dorsal processes on the caudal vertebrae are near five feet in length from top to bottom. So if you do a little mind experiment with me and surround that with muscle and put skin on it, you've got a tail there maybe six, seven foot across and 30 feet long. Okay? So what we're talking about here in Job chapter 40, 15, or 17, is what's coming up on the screen. That's what I think. The animal that had a tail that swayed like a cedar had a tail that could sway like a cedar. We're talking about a sauropod. Behemoth was a sauropod. Now, the clincher is that cannot be explained away is verse 19. In verse 19, it says, He ranks first among the works of God, yet his maker can approach him with his sword. So we realize that God is teaching Job a lesson about his power and his protection, and there have been dozens and dozens of questions asked him by God, and this is one of them, have you considered behemoth? 
God made that animal the first of his works, the greatest land animal that was ever created, certainly bigger than an elephant and much bigger than a hippo. Behemoth was a sauropod. What does that mean? Job was written about the time of Abraham or a little after, so we're talking about three or so hundred years after the flood. So this is an indication that these animals were walking around on the earth once the flood was over, meaning mommy and daddy behemoth were on the ark. I think it's pretty obvious. So I think we've answered both of those questions. Now finally, are there any of them alive? I'm going to give you one example. There's dozens of these, but I don't have time. One, one example. Dr. Paul LeBlond was teaching the British and American Zoological Associations. He's an oceanographer at the University of British Columbia. And in the New Scientist in uh, January, I think it's 1993, I can't read it from here, but I think it's 90, yeah, January 93. But to Dr. Paul LeBlanc, professor of oceanography at the University of British Columbia, Caddy or Cadborosaurus is a genuine scientific puzzle. At the end of last month, he presented a paper on the biology of the unknown creature, Cadborosaurus, to a joint meeting of the Canadian American Societies of, of Zoology in Vancouver. There continues to be about one authenticated site. Notice what this says, new scientists. This is not ladies' home journal. There continues to be about one authenticated sighting of the creature each year, and at various times over the past 60 years, local people have held what they claim to be specimens of caddy in their hands. One three-meter juvenile was apparently removed from the stomach of a sperm whale. Now, I think that's significant. In other words, can some of these animals still exist? Dr. Dr. Paul Mackel from the University of Chicago, a world-class biologist, said there's absolutely no reason why there couldn't be a few of these animals in certain periods or areas of the earth where it is still primitive enough and raw enough without human habitation for them to exist. And they've got dozens of sightings of, of unknown creatures in the area of Lake Tele around um, the Lea Koala region of the Congo, for example. And so I suggest to you that this is a possibility. We don't know. A lot more research needs to be done. But the point is, they're now beginning to think it is possible that maybe a few of these creatures could exist. So what does that mean? What does all this mean? It means there was a flood. It means that Noah had to get in the ark to be saved. It means that you and I have to get in the ark to be saved. It means that there's another great catastrophe coming, only this time it's not water, it's fire. It means that the same Word of God, according to 2 Peter chapter 3, the same Word of God that brought the water is the same Word of God that's going to bring the fire. Now, don't worry about the fire. God's got that under control. Someone says, where's the fire coming from? Don't worry about that. You just get in the ark. God can handle the fire. Hey, there's a volcano up in Yellowstone National Park that's 55 miles across one direction the crater and 30 miles across the other direction. If that thing blows its top and it's huffing and puffing and heaving and spewing right now, if it blows its top, North America's gone. Indianapolis is history. There will be no agriculture in North America for 10,000 years, they're telling us. Don't worry about the fire. God's got that under control. You just be sure you're in the ark. That's your job. You have to be hid away with Christ in God. You have to be buried into Christ. Amen. So what's the truth about dinosaurs? There was a flood. God created them on day six. They're just lizards. They lived with men. There's tons of evidence to support these incredible relationships that we predict from the biblical model. So that being the case, be aware that we have a biblical view that is very consistent with the kinds of things that we see today, that dinosaurs aren't mysterious, strange creatures. They're creatures that God created to help Adam and Eve, and they did until... Adam sinned. That's